Chapter 9 Measurement Having gone from a broad research topic to a more clear interest to a specific research question in the previous chapter on conceptualization and operationalization, we turn our attention to becoming even more specific. You may think to yourself, what is the value of putting so much effort into every little word we say when we asked the question? Again, here is one of those areas where social work research and other forms of social work practice overlap, and they do so considerably. <clears throat> you know the old saying, even a broken clock is right two times a day. Well, a poorly designed research question can be worse than a broken clock. If you don't ask the questions correctly, you might never get an answer that you can use. In the previous chapter, we talked about measurement errors, which fall into two primary categories. Random errors, about which we can sometimes do little, and systematic errors, which is something that we should consider during all phases of our measurement and instrument creation. Systematic error is the product of either the way we ask questions, the order in which we ask questions, or even how and where we placed questions on questionnaires. Quite often, systematic errors result from the ways in which we introduce bias into the research process. Systematic error, as its name implies, means the information we collect consistently falsely represents the phenomenon that we are studying. Consistently, it is, is the operative word here. When we recognize that we have received dubious information as a result of our survey instruments or other research protocols, it becomes impossible to test whether the, the error was systematic or random using statistical analysis. In the data analysis process, this is often called doing a sanity test and really is of little value beyond just making sense of whether or not bias exists. We will go more into data analysis in the coming semester. Suffice it to say for now that when we have introduced bias, which produces unexpected findings, and when we, and we find that there is a pattern to those unexpected findings, we can probably trace the problem back to ourselves and the way we worded questions and other procedural issues. The most common way in which we introduce systematic error is when we get biases involved. We all have biases. When you think about having a bias, it is important to remember that the term bias is not synonymous with being a racist, sexist, or any other kind of chauvinistic or bigoted person who despises other population. Individuals develop within whatever worldview they develop within, and therefore they have become biased towards or about their own worldview. When developing questions, you use the type of words that you used to, to from your own development. Where bias becomes problematic is when we fail to recognize that our way of stating things, approaching things, our cultural norms, etc., are not universal. This does not mean whatever way we communicate is better or worse than another culture. It just means that it's different. Sometimes there are biases built into our research format that have little to do with us or the way we are asking questions. Sometimes it is what we are talking about that is the bias producing phenomenon. Two similar phenomena are the acquiescence response set and the social desirability bias. I like to think of the acquiescence response set as the codependent response set. <clears throat> what this is is the tendency that people have in general to appear acceptable to other people by being agreeable with them. 
This is especially problematic when conducting face-to-face -face interview. Respondents try to guess what the appropriate answer is based on what they think the interviewer would like to hear. For example, if you're conducting interviews on the subject of uh, racism, one would predict there would be different responses based solely on the perceived race of the interviewer. The same could potentially be true for issues around gender, politics, sexual orientation, etc. Now the social desirability bias is very similar but it has more of a macro orientation. It is the phenomenon of introducing false answers because of the perceived expectation of what is normal in society. So for example, when conducting research around taboo topics or highly sensitive topics such as human sexuality, one might get responses that more reflect the beliefs about what is normal rather than what behaviors the respondent is actually doing. And if all that wasn't bad enough, if we run into problems because of our individual desire to please, our desire to be able to fit into society as a normal person causing miscommunication of the true state of affairs, when we throw cultural variation into the mix, it can become even more difficult. Now, when we think of cultural bias, again, don't think in things such as avoiding the n-word or using other racist or sexist language which of course you shouldn't but rather it is thinking about the variation in cultural norms this becomes most apparent in working across cultures that have starkly different cultural norms than those of the research team for example for people from many cultures it is not if not most cultures, having open and unbiased communication about sexual practices is quite difficult. Now take those types of situations where there may be strict separation of genders around communication or there may be religious considerations. Getting down to the actuality of the human behaviors can sometimes be quite tricksy. Misleading or poorly worded questions are par for the course. Respondents who want their own surveys should enroll in a research methods course. Kidding, of course. Random error can occur when we choose words that have multiple meanings. Quite often we can get quite clear about communication from context, but many times we rely on a feedback loop with survey questionnaires, at least the ones that are administered remotely or anonymously, we don't have the luxury of feedback. Many times, as well, random error results simply because our protocols are too long, too boring, <laughs> too complex for people to stay on task with. In addition, we often use professional jargon. However, I would say that professional jargon can also be what be a way of introducing systematic bias. Professional jargon is often best understood by others who are in the same profession. Similarly, they are well understood by people who use the services of that particular profession. To a lesser extent, a highly educated person, one who is well read, might know quite a bit of professional, might not know a might know quite a bit of professional jargon outside of their own discipline. Finally, the person who is less highly educated, but perhaps who has never had the need for a professional service, may be completely clueless about the meaning of professional jargon. Therefore, it is my contention that professional jargon biases our research to favor our profession and the more highly educated. <clears throat> Slide six. 
once we have worked through our biases, we have to decide how we are going to gather the information. What form of data gathering are we going to use and from what source are we going to gather it? Overwhelmingly, social researchers use some kind of written survey instrument to gather information. That can come in the form of the anonymous survey or the interviewer facilitated survey. Both of these have the potential to induce the respondent to answer in a way that conforms to the interviewer's worldview rather than report accurately the interviewee's worldview. Sometimes we can get around this by having multiple interviewers to check to make sure that our bias is minimized. With self-report surveys, it is best that we have a variety of individuals fill out the surveys and give us feedback on their understandability. Of course, we can always directly observe people but that is not without bias. Our biases as researchers will still be present. Also, in the case of direct observation, our presence might change the way the participants are acting. Oftentimes in social work research, and almost always when we are doing social work evaluation of our practice or programs, we do some amount of data gathering from existing records. While these records do reflect real-world data, it does not mean that they are without potential for having error. Practitioners might exaggerate their input or minimize. For example, when a practitioner first interviews a new client, all of that client's problems are often presented to the practitioner for the first time. This had the effect of making the client perhaps look worse than they actually are. Conversely, when that same practitioner has worked with that same client over a period of time, all those problems are perhaps not present at the same time, or as is often the case, <clears throat> client problems which should have been relegated to the history book are often reported as if they are ongoing phenomenon. Therefore, there is a systematic bias towards recording client improvement. There also is a bias to report improvement because your job depends on it. Sometimes documents <coughs> are simply not recorded correctly and this is not necessarily the fault of the clinician. For example, I remember a case manager who had more billable hours than they actually worked. How is that possible, you might ask? Well, in this case, the process of billing was in 13, excuse me, 15 or 30 minute increments. I forget which now. But essentially, if someone saw a client for five minutes for a quick check-in and they billed for it, they had to bail in a 15 or 30 minute increment. Potentially, one could see three or four people within a 30 minute time frame and bill up to an hour and a half or two hours. Again, systematic error couples with personal biases. With an emphasis on reimbursement and billable hours, many clinicians working in agencies have an incentive to write down that extra 15 minutes to make sure that they go over an hour so that they can bill for 90 minutes. Slide 7. The example that the authors talk about regarding unbiased wording can have unintentional, unintentional results. During the period of time that the term American Indian was falling out of vogue in favor of Native American, mistakes in semantics were common when researching that population. So here is an example where attempting to be more socially correct or politically correct introduced a data collection bias. Some other ways that we can avoid measurement errors is through careful training of research staff. Finding ways to gather data without intruding oneself into the process and when using existing records to be fully versed in how those records are kept 
and who is keeping them, and of course not to forget what purpose the records were kept. The best way, I think, to avoid measurement errors is to use triangulation, which is a term used by land surveyors to measure the distance of remote points. It can be highly accurate. When the land surveyor does, what the land surveyor does is to establish a distance between two points and then measure the angles between the two points and the angle to the third point of an unknown distance. Then using geometry, the, the distance <clears throat> is known. We use triangulation <clears throat> when we ask questions of, for example, a child in school. How are you getting along in your classes, Jimmy? Then we ask the teacher. How is Jimmy getting along in class? Then we call the parents or the parent parent or the parents and say, How is Jimmy getting along in class? So even though we have three points in this example to help us understand how Jimmy is getting along in class, it is still triangulation, not a quadrangulation, because we're all focused on Jimmy. We could have twenty sec separate points of information about a phenomenon and we would still call it triangulation. <clears throat> Reliability. Remember repeatability. The broken clock is capable of reading the correct time only twice away, twice a day, excuse me. So while that it is reliable, it is not a useful instrument. To be reliable it would have to give us the correct time whenever we looked at it. It's reliable and useful. The example on page 195 of the text regarding worker morale highlights yet another conceptualization leading to oper operationalization process which now is leading into constructing measurement instruments. What do we mean by morale. How do we measure it? Is a measure valid at one time and not another? For example, worker turnover is one indicator of worker morale. However, during times of easy job ability and high wages, workers might be shifting from agency to agency because they have low morale at the agency, not because they have low morale at the agency, but because they have an opportunity for higher wages. Similarly and conversely during periods of economic downsizing, unhappy employees might stick around much longer when there, when there is no prospect for a paycheck in sight. Types of reliability. We worry about integrator or inter-observer reliability mainly when there is a research team present. However, if your research involves subjectively quantifying observations, it might be good to include a process of training for inter-rater reliability because it helps the researcher operationalize the concepts they are looking for in their observations. Split halves <coughs> methods of reliability assess the correlation of subscores among different subsets or, or half of the other items. Parallel forms methods require constructing a second measuring instrument that is thought to be equivalent to the first. Finally, coefficient alpha is the most common and powerful method. Coefficient alpha is at about 90 percent or above is considered to be excellent, whereas at around 80 to 0 0.80 to 0 0.89 uh, they're considered good. Now validity. There isn't a test or any sort of objective measure for face validity. We say that 
A measure has face validity when it is determined by knowledgeable people to be suitable for the task at hand. So for example, if you did not have a suitable measurement instrument for post-traumatic stress disorder, however there are, and you need to construct one, you, one could ask a group of clinicians experienced with post-traumatic stress disorder if the instrument was suitable. That same research instrument, if it contained the full range of meanings that are included with the content, say for example, hypervigilance, sleeplessness, re-experiencing the traumatic event, etc., that goes into the range of PTSD, then we could say that it had content validity as well. Both of these ways of establishing validity <coughs> Our judgments based are judgment based and should only be used when more rigorously, rigorously tested measurement instruments are not available. <sighs> Criterion validity <clears throat> is the type of validity where an instrument has been tested on a known population. For example, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, aka the MMPI, was first developed using face validity, along with content validity. But then it was administered to people who had been clinically diagnosed with a full range of disorders. Therefore, the sections that determine alcoholism in the MMPI, or paranoia, etc., are said to have criterion validity. Sometimes we develop research instruments that are able to predict future events such as the SAT tests. These are not tests of intelligence. They are tests that predict success in college, nothing else. So if somebody has a higher SAT test score than you do, and <clears throat> and they claim that they are smarter than you are or more intelligent than you, you can say, well, wait a minute. That is only a test of likely success in college and not intelligence. Similarly, sometimes we test using research instruments that have concurrent validity. An example of concurrent validity would be measures of activities of daily living as compared to a nurse or occupational therapist rating of ability on activities of daily li living. If your self-administered ADL rating scale corresponded to the nurse or therapist rating scale, then we could say that it has concurrent that it is concurrently valid. And therefore we could administer that scale rather than having to have the nurse or therapist to make a home visit. Convergent validity results correspond to the results of other methods of measuring the same construct. construct. Discriminant validity results do not correspond as highly with measures of other constructs as they do with other measures of other constructs as they do with other measures of the same construct. Ugh. When we create our survey instruments and when we use a series of items to describe abstract concepts, it is important for us to determine the convergent and discriminant validity of these measurement instruments we have created. Convergent, as the name would imply, means that the variety of questions that you ask together to describe the concept. So for example, if you have five questions on religiousness, attendance at church, mosque, temple, or other religious event, a statement of personal meaning and importance of religion, how important it is to have friends with the same beliefs, whether you were raised in a religious tradition that you remain in, etc. Important point would be that if all the items converge in a similar way, so individuals who score high on one indicator of religiousness would also score high on the, on the other indicators of religiousness. Conversely, those who scored low on one would, go, <clears throat> would also 
go low on the rest. Compared to discriminant validity, the measure is said to have good discriminant validity when it is measuring only those attributes of the concept and nothing else. For example, if one of your religious scale questions has to do with friendships having similar belief systems, it was also shown to be highly correlated with questions around the importance of friendships, then there might be some concern that you are in fact measuring the importance of friendships, not the importance of religiousness. Complicated, I know. When we think about factorial validity, it is important to recognize that many of our clinical scales have symptoms that we measure, which are used for multiple diagnostic instruments. Therefore, that process leads over, bleeds over quite a lot into the social work research process. Essentially, we use these instruments clinically when we try to discriminate between various disorders. Going back to the example of the MMPI, in that research instruments are numerous in that research instruments there are numerous questions that are actually independent scales of things like depression, paranoia, alcoholism, schizophrenia, and the list goes on and on and on. And therefore the entire survey instrument is considered factorially valid when each of those subscales co correspond well with all of their other items. Essentially does the depression section measure depression? Does the alcoholism section measure, measure um, um, paranoia, for example, etc.? If there are any hunters in the crowd or individuals who enjoy sport shooting, they will recognize the typical shooting range target, complete with bullet holes. When we say that an instrument is reliable but not valid, it is like the hunter who is taking target practice and consistently puts the bullets into a small grouping, but that grouping is not in the area where they are aiming. In this case, we would think that the rifle scope is not of high quality, <coughs> that it is of high quality, and he consistently, he or she consistently aims in the same area, but that it is set a little high and to the right. In the middle target, we see that the bullet holes are literally all over the map or the target. In this case, a hunter would suspect that they have a defective hunting scopes, or perhaps they just have poor skills. And finally, we see in the column on the right-hand side that the grouping of bullet holes in the, are in the center of the target. We would say that rifle is valid and reliable, the rifle and the hunter, that is. Establishing reliability and validity in qualitative research is a subjective process. Does the interview instruments slash procedures lead to a shared understanding of the worldview slash phenomenon of understudy? Or does it tend to lead to miscommunication and differential understandings of the same phenomenon? Because qualitative methods are much more flexible, it is more about whether your research instrument is measuring what you intend to measure. When conducting qualitative research, one of the most important things that you can build into your research proposal is some method of triangulation. If you are relying on observation of the child's behavior at school, perhaps get observations from the teacher's aide or the teacher in addition to your own. Similarly, if your research is more global, you might get information from other important people, parents, significant others, siblings, etc. Qualitative methods often rely on member checking, which means taking the interpretations back to the individuals you have researched to make sure there is agreement as to your analysis. 
Validity in qualitative research is equally subjective process. However, we can subject our results to some test. It is the, <clears throat> is the meaning internally consistent? What that means is when we ascribe meaning to a response, is that consistent with the types of responses to other inquiries that we had with the same person? Essentially, does the interviewee contradict themselves? We can also ask whether our questionnaire creates a complete picture amenable to complete interpretation. Also, when we do validity checks of qualitative research, we ask ourselves, does the interpretation fit with the data? Oftentimes, and especially with qualitative methods, researchers will be looking through their personal worldview lens and put an overlay on the analysis that should not actually be there. And finally, of course, it is meaningful. Is it meaningful? Does it make sense? Does it pass the test? Does it pass the so what test? Okay.